Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. The famine of the end times. Let's recap just briefly Deuteronomy chapter 8. That chapter that Jesus himself addressed in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan tempted him, saying, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And our Father, teaching in that Deuteronomy chapter 8, stipulated that if we follow every word as best we can, then we're going to receive his blessings. He utilized the example of having fed manna in the wilderness. And then on the other hand, naturally, the reverse side of that is this, that if you don't follow every word, and after he blesses you, and I'm, I'm kind of basically giving a rundown on Deuteronomy 8, which we did not cover, the final verses, that if you get if you get in a position where you're wealthy with God's blessings and all of a sudden you take a turn and say, I, I put this all together. I created all this wealth for myself. And forget who blessed you. There's, there's nothing, there is nothing wrong with a Christian being rich when it's with God's blessings. That's, that's his promise. If, um, if you do every word, if you thirst after, if you crave, if you pine after the word of God and do what he would have you do, be a doer within it, then you're going to be blessed. No, no one can prevent God from doing that. Uh, therefore, um, it's so much easier to thirst after the word and receive God's blessings rather than have everything that you earn or make blown away in, by one way or the other. I would much prefer the blessings of God. And as Deuteronomy 8 stipulated and as Christ was talking about, you don't live by bread alone but by every word of God, then so be it. That's where your blessings come from. He causes things to happen in our favor in that way. Now, I call this lecture End Times. Let's date it. What, what especially was he speaking of concerning the famine of the end times? And what would that famine be for? We learned that in the eighth chapter of Amos in the Minor Prophets. I want you to turn there with me, and we're going to cover much of the entire chapter. Let's fix the date, if we may, or the dispensation that it has reference to. I would also remind you that we're living in that time of the parable of the fig tree, which would be the last, the final generation. So this will hook you and that famine in the same generation. You do with it as you choose. Chapter 8, book of Amos, verse 1, and it reads, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. Now, this in a sense sets the date because what, what is summer fruit? What is this word in the Hebrew, summer? It means ripe. It means, uh, the word even means harvest or time of harvest. So, what is the time of harvest for God as far as this dispensation, the final, uh, is? That, that's the time of harvest that Christ returns and the threshers thresh and the fruit is, will be harvested. And the fruit, of course, is his children. Verse 2, And he said, Amos, what seest thou? What do you see there? And Amos, of course, in this vision, sees this basket. And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Again, I repeat, ripe fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end, and I repeat, 
The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And basically ripe for correction, harvest, everything. That is to say, those things that our father in Deuteronomy 8 stipulated would come to pass. Three, and the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. What kind of howling? This means the churches, the religious worshipers, their songs are going to be howlings. They shall, there shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. That's with a hush. Why? It's not talking about dead bodies, flesh. It's talking about spiritually dead. Even in the temple itself, people spiritually dead. Why? Because every word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, many times, is not taught there. Thus, it's not really a house of God. For a house of God is for God's word, not man's, not some systems, not some religious organization, but for the word of God, if it wishes his blessings. I mean, does that sound familiar? Verse 4, hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. And that happens out of uh, deception, usury, so forth, by those that are biblically illiterate, that are not uh, accustomed to God's ways in doing business, such as getting so tied up in usury, they can't make ends meet, five. And he's talking to those that would participate in outwitting, if you would, uh, God's children. Verse five, saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? In other words, all they can think about as far as church is concerned is not what's being taught there, not God's word. But how quick will this be over so we can rip this bunch off again? And the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat making the eve off, let's just call it a bushel, uh, it'll fit, eve off small, and the shackle great. In other words, we're going to make the bushel, we're going to cut it a little short, but at the same time, we're going to, with inflation, make the shekel or the dollar great. And falsifying the balances by deceit. And, you know, many people do not realize that inflation gives false balances. In other words, many people who go on strike for, let's say for one dollar, and I mean they really get upset to get that extra dollar to put aside for retirement, and they go on strike even for it. And, and I'm not taking sides within this, I just want to make my point. And they work all year, and they put aside a certain number of dollars uh, valued for that specific year. What happens when the first of the year rolls around? Inflation hits and it edges up some. And by the time that this person has put this away, these monies, inflation has risen to such a place or the scales have tipped so far that 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 was worth much here is very little here. And actually, the person worked for peanuts when he thought he was drawing a pretty good wage, but inflation destroyed it. He didn't put hardly anything away after inflation gets through. Um, when I was a small lad, uh, at the time, say, that my grandfather would have retired, you could buy a new car for six or eight hundred dollars. Six or eight hundred dollars. Sure, you didn't make a great deal of salary at that time, but adequate. And people began paying in Social Security not too long after this, or about that time. It, it was founded and began. 
And now a car, a new car, and I realize there's a lot more to a car. I mean, we've got everything automatic now. It would have frightened an old Model T to death if you would have put flashing turn signals on it. Or what would it have done with, um, with air conditioning? It would not have known how to handle it and its little old engine couldn't have huffed it anyway. But be that as it may, I want to be fair in this. But you're going to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 today for an automobile. Friend, what caused that? Mostly inflation. What you worked for in your youth, the scales are deceitful. They've been tipped. I just wanted to make my point. Else you think, well, I'm too wise for someone to pull something like that on me. Well, you'd better be wise enough in your father's every word that you know how to combat inflation and plan ahead for it or you will be in much trouble. But the balances are tipped. How can we get out of this so-called religious le re meeting to rip these people off again? That's what the enemy of God's children would say. Verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. They'll work all day for a pair of shoes, maybe two or three days. Yea, and sell the refuse, the molded of the wheat. They'll buy anything. We can, we can cook it, drop it up, pop it, even strip the mold off, and they'll buy it, even with the heart of the, the uh, wheat out of it. They'll still, uh, they'll, uh, we can take the um, wheat germ out and use it in our own best, and they'll buy the hull or the brand. They don't know the difference. In God's word, it gives you the value of food. Verse 7, that is to say health-wise. Verse 7, the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob. When Jacob is used, that means all the natural tribes. Surely, I will never forget any of their works, and God won't. Nobody's getting away with anything. Every, there's a payday coming, and everything will made be made right. Verse 8, shall not the land tremble for this? And everyone mourn that dwelleth therein? That's a question. And it shall rise up wholly as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt, as the old Nile would go on the rampage you know what this flood is. It's the flood mentioned in Revelation chapter 12 of Satan's lies that will cap it all off when he returns as the spurious Messiah. How are you fixed for it, friend? You see, I want to make my point real well. Without the word of God, you're going to be deceived by it, by this flood and taken under. Revelation, again, Revelation 12 makes it very clear. That's the cap off. That's the final artistry of deception. And I'm sorry, if you're biblically illiterate, friend, I would not wish to be in your shoes because you have not been able to prepare mentally or spiritually for that that is about to happen, especially, especially if you have been misled by false teaching by one verse reverends that never quite get around to letting God speak to you, but read one verse and unfortunately many of them don't even read a whole verse. They stop and get the subject off on whatever they wish to turn it to, sometimes self. Now we do have some good ministers, not all are that way, but I don't have to tell you, you know the kettle when you see it. The big deceiver shall come, and many, thinking as their church system has told them that Christ has returned, sorry, dude, it's the Antichrist. The first one taken in the field is a harlot, and many in their system say, I want to be the first one taken from the field. You'd better wake up. The famine for hearing God's word is especially bad in this generation. That's what he's talking about. That's why I wanted to date this. At the end, you read it in verse two. 
he used a natural thing, a basket of harvested fruit to let you know it's time. And when it is time, this is what will be happening. And friend, it doesn't take a very sharp person to recognize all of these things happening in the land today. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day. You can count on it. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And of course, we know that this looks forward to that time that Christ himself will return, the true Messiah, at the second advent. In other words, do you remember what happened when Christ was crucified? What happened at noon? The sun went down again. It went dark. A major sign that that one that was on the cross crucified was Messiah, the true one. There is a day of darkness coming again soon. And many are going to think that Christ is already with us and they've already participated in a wedding and many of them spiritually with child when the true Christ returns as he himself stipulated in Matthew chapter 24. Wake up, my friend. Verse 10. And I will turn your feast into mourning. You know what a feast is? You're celebrating in church that you have the truth. I'm going to turn it into a very sad day for you. That's talking about those that are not into the word. Those that, um, with little rhymes and short sayings, because they feel that people probably cannot understand the truth or God's word in the first place, play gang, little children's games with them about salvation and baptism, two of the most beautiful things. But that's as far as they get. They never get into the meat of God's word that's going to be turned into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. You know what a lamentation is? That's a sad song. Bad news, Charlie. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all, upon all loins. That means a time for severe mourning and boldness upon every head. Another sign of outwardly of mourning. And I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. The trouble is, they're going to be mourning because they've been worshiping the false son. And the true son that was crucified returns in that day, and they realize they were deceived. Why? The balance is tipped in tilted in so many ways, spiritually and physically, that they have made a mess out of their lives in this flesh age where God is proving them. He that does the proving, as he stipulated in Deuteronomy 8, is the one also that does the judging. Not man, not your minister, not your best friend, but our Father. And he has given you his gentle but bold word telling you exactly how to beat, if you would, I'll use this terminology, the system of Satan. Have you listened? Have you studied? Have you learned? Do you know how to beat Satan? God will bless you with every dollar that you can take care of but he knows exactly how many you have the ability to take care of. That's to say blessing dollars. I, I use that here, it fits real good. And many people wonder why they don't have much. You can't take care of it because you're not familiar with our Father's word that you'll let the unbalanced scales rip you off if it was given to you, the blessing. God's blessing would end up in Satan's hands. I know that might offend some, but it is God's truth. Yep, mourning of an only son. That's bitter. 
But wait until you see when they confuse the false son with the true son, even as they chose Barabbas instead of Jesus Christ to escape crucifixion. That's foolish talk in a sense, but that's what people choose. Most often when they're not biblically um, uh, literate, they're going to choose the wrong way. Why? They don't know any better. Now we come to the point, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Do you, first of all, there is a famine, but do you know who sent it? Now wake up to that fact. Read it. God sent it. God sent the famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's the famine of the end times. But straightforward, who sent it? God did. Why? Well, how did he do that? If he does not bless teachers with the gift of the ability to teach the word in the simplicity in which our Father delivered it, then a famine is automatically in place. You be the judge. I don't know. Surely you're intelligent enough that you can tell, is God's word taught in my house of God, the house of God I attend, and or listen to, or whatever, do I understand or have I taken it up on myself to study chapter by chapter and verse by verse whereby God's word flows so smoothly and so simply that I can tell when somebody's ripping me off? Or am I, am I a little slow and think I know my way around in the world, but I can't see behind this scene because the enemy's not going to let you. But God's word gives you that open door that no one can close behind that scene of the enemy. And you can beat the enemy at his own game, having God's blessings. Yes, the famine is for hearing the word of God. And this is the generation which the famine would be the greatest. You know, it's a very rewarding thing to this teacher that I receive thousands, not hundreds, thousands of letters. And it's kind of a shame in a way as a teacher to hear this in relationship to other teachers. Thousands. Anyway, I say this, it's going to sound like I'm blowing my horn, but I assure you, not my horn, God's gift saying, I've only listened to you for two months and I've learned more in that two months or two weeks in some cases than I did my entire life 30 years or more in a church. That's a disgrace. I receive at least a minimum or two or three hundred letters a day with that statement in it. Think about it. It's a disgrace to the church world that this, the simplicity of the word simply is not taught. But the traditions of men or their church system, in many cases, it's bad. And letting me know the famine is upon us. For certainly this teacher, this teacher, does nothing spectacular. I only teach the Word of God chapter by chapter with no fanfare, no sideshows. Straight on, line by line, and with the utmost of my ability to take you back into the languages whereby it's simplified that a child can understand. That's, anyone should be able to do that, especially if they're gifted from God. And the churches would be running over in this land, because it would create a thirst because we are in a famine. People are starving for the truth, starving to hear the Word of God. No man can take credit for any gift given for God because that gift is God's, and we are all one family. Let's all try 
to get stronger into the Word of God, that we are freed from that famine. And as the blessing in the beatitude in which we started this lecture in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 6, that we will be well fed, or as the Greek foddered, that is to say, the shepherd will have fed us uh, till we're gorged. That's the Greek. That's what his word will do for you. I want to go on now, if I may. Let's go to verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I don't know, have you ever looked for a church home where you could be taught God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse? I don't know, how did your experience go? Judging from the letters I receive, many are not having that much luck in hearing in their quest, even though they thirst for the word of God. Think about it. I'm not trying to injure anyone. I'm trying to cause people, every pastor, to want to get deeper into the word of God. Read on ahead with me, if you would, uh, to chapter 9 in this great book of Amos. I'm going to go down to the ninth verse. This is the ultimate. This is what happens. This is why God proves his children as to whether they've had his word or not, that call upon his name or go by his name, Christ man or Christian. Verse 9 of chapter 9. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. That's why he's proving us. Do you know what a sift is? Like as corn is, sheave, is uh, sifted in a sheave, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. In other words, I'm not going to lose a soul under certain conditions. Why? What conditions? Verse 10. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. We're not going to lose them. They're just going to die. Which say, this is the qualification, which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. We don't have to study God's word because we're going to be gone. We don't have to understand God's word. We're not going to be here in that part. Well, you know, it's, that's really a little bit on the dumb side. If you don't read God's word to find out what's going to happen, how do you know? You don't. God is not a waster of time. The word is written for everyone today, all of it. Eleven, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. What is that? Christ's throne. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. That's when it's going to happen. One more verse, 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. That's even Esau whom God hated that the children, um, that, uh, that what? That believe upon Christ, listen, through his word. And of all the heathen, we're not just talking about Israel, we're talking about everyone, all tribes, all people, which are called by my name. That's important. That's the qualifier, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. He has a plan. He's proving the children. I don't know. How are you doing? Do you thirst, as we read in that beatitude, for hearing the word of God? Do you hunger for the truth? Do you enjoy studying God's word in its simplicity? I'm, I'm going to close this lecture with the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, and I'm going to close it with um, the final two verses. The famine of the end times, especially in nations that are so blessed with the production of grain and many other things. I know there are nations that suffer, little children, but most people that claim to be suffering in this nation um, are and starving 
uh, appear to me to be overweight. So I, I ponder many things and try to, I'm a realist, I look at the real facts that are before me. There is a greater famine for hearing the truth. There is a starvation throughout the land for hearing the true word of God, for people getting into the true word of God. Chapter 7, the great book of Revelation, which means the unveiling, that book that many don't read because their pastors tell them not to, or they don't need to understand it, or it can't be understood. Strange God titled it Revelation or the Revealing when he didn't want you to understand it. Wake up, stop listening to men, and listen to your Father God. Verse 16 of the seventh chapter. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. It's going to be comfortable. We're talking about when we get there. 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, shall fodder them. If you ask for truth in God's word and study and ask that the Holy Spirit help you, he will feed you. He will see that you understand the word of God whereby you receive God's blessings, not only you, but your whole family, if, you're, if you lead your family, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Enough of the sad songs. Enough of deception. When we have a heavenly Father that provides us everything, when we do it His way, with faith believing His Word, knowing that our Father provides what it is that we are to have. Yes, back to that beatitude. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's Matthew 5, verse 6. I'm quoting it. For they will find it and be filled. Filled with what? Blessings, with knowledge, and knowledge from God, all wisdom truly comes from our Father. He teaches you how to handle wealth. He teaches you how to handle blessings. Whereby in receiving his blessings, then and understanding his truth, you see, true wisdom in the word of God is not to see how complicated you can make things. But true wisdom is to, with the gift of God, is to take that that is muddied and complicated and simplify it whereby anyone can understand it and God's Word jumps to life. It, the pages come alive for it's real. And you become a realist. And you face life in reality, for Christianity is not a religion. It is a reality. And God's Word documents that. How precious His Word that He has given us. His Word that strengthens us. His Word that feeds us. His Word that gives us strength to accomplish whatever we need to accomplish. Because he gives you, if you have the faith and you're well fed in his word, he gives you the unction or the ingenuity in your mind to be successful. When you try something for him, you will always succeed because as in the beginning of this study, I told you, if you dedicate yourself to God, he will in turn dedicate himself to you. That's, that's kind of the prime of faith, if you would. Totalness of reality. Not a thing of belief, but it is a reality.
in your life. That's what God's word will do for you. It is so precious. It is so important. It's the only path to find peace of mind in this shook up world. It's only the people that are shook up. God's word is still very stable, fulfilling, comforting, and brings you peace of mind. Nothing to worry about. Because overall, one of the things you learn from our Father's Word is that He's in control. And if you truly love Him, hey, that's all right with you. You wouldn't have it any other way. That's kind of some of the first seeds to finding peace of mind under Him, the Commander-in-Chief of the universe, the world, and all therein loves you, will lead you, will teach you through his word. Never let a day go by that you do not thank him for the fact that he sent the living word to us. And the famine concerns that living word. It is amazing to me how that so-called Christians are ridiculed in today's press simply for having been mentioned. People kind of get that. <laughs> Idiots. They don't know any better. Why? They're starving. Starving for what? Knowledge and wisdom. For you see, compared to the knowledge that is in God's Word and that peace of mind, the knowledge of liberalism and the knowledge of the world is stupidity. For God wrote long ago that those that are at the head of the press and government, many of them have the minds of babes, meaning there's no wisdom there. They cannot utilize common sense. Oh well, don't be a part of them. Be wise by being well fed and blessed from your Father's Word. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, if we may please, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. The spirit moves. Hey, share the question. We can no longer answer all of them, but we'll take a handful. Who knows? Yours may be there. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? He is your father. He's the closest relative you will ever have. You see, he brought you into being. And he cares. He loves you. May not love what you're doing, but he loves you. So talk to him and ask for understanding, knowledge, and wisdom in his word. He will grant it. Search, thirst, and you will find. Father, around the globe we come and we thank you, Father, for the platform 
in thy gifts, Father, and we ask that the blessings around the world at this time that you touch, lead, guide, direct, heal in Yahshua's precious name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, Don from North Carolina has a question. Upon your death, you discover that a loved one who passed, preceded you, is on the wrong side of the gulf, and this has reference to Luke 16 in paradise. Will you be distressed when you find this out, or will you not have feelings as we know them here on earth? Oh, we will have feelings. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel 44, the millennium chapters, will document that for you inasmuch as as one of God's the doc, which is a Hebrew word that simply means the just, the elect, you have the right to go help that one. And I don't know, 44, about 24 or 5 will tell you uh, in what connection your loved ones. Uh, Laura from California. I've been a member of my church for 30 years, and I've learned more from you in the last month. And you see, usually I don't read this part, but... Today, I thought, why not? There, this, uh, uh, when I would have started this, I would have stopped. <clears throat> In the last month that I have during the entire 30 years at my church, thank you. We thank our Father for his gift and his word, Laura. Thank you. The Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. I did not place that message there. It was there by the Holy Spirit. Pastor Murray, you mentioned the health and food laws the other day, and I've never heard this before. Where is it in the Bible, and do you have any tapes or books on this subject? Thank you. We sure do. I have a tape titled uh, Health God's Way, but I would recommend uh, um, Dr. Alexander, and from Doctor's Corner, a, a good friend of mine, a great worker for our Heavenly Father, who was a medical doctor, a surgeon, who uh, decided that it was better to show people how to prevent illness God's way than to cut their problems out. And an excellent teacher, and I would you'll find his listed in the um, tape catalog. And uh, his general health tapes are just excellent, excellent. And then he has tapes on various problems. Leviticus chapter 11 tells you how to eat, and I'll let you take it from there. Polly from Pennsylvania. It may seem like I am grasping at straws, but I cannot discount how God has called my child to him. I must assume there is something in the complete truth that I do not as yet know because I know that every single word in the Bible will stand forever. Well, bless your heart. I see where you're coming from, and I, this is a very tender subject, and it has to do with um, a man's ark will never enter, the, cannot enter, I'm going to say the kingdom. That means in certain places, but certainly they are God's children. And we should not be too quick to decide who is a Mamzar. As a matter of fact, the Mishnah in one place from the tribe of Judah stipulates that you should never judge someone as a Mamzar because it might be from one of the ten tribes that went north. What this has to do with is, is the um, word. A child does not suffer for apparent sin. And when one does not know, there is no sin in the first place. It is the people of the world that in certain places cause the child to suffer because of, um, of um, the mamzer uh, not being liked by people that are ignorant. But other than that, there's not that much of a problem. They have their own kings, they're God's children, and there is no problem. So probably, Polly, I agree, you're doing real good. Hang tough. And uh, you see, everyone, even the Kenites themselves, are welcomed into the congregation of God. 
But he still, even in the eternity, has the tribes that have their own kings and separation to a point, not from God, but simply because that's the way they want it. Ezekiel was showing that even in the millennium when there was a river that certain people couldn't cross, but there was food on both sides, meaning God was on both sides. So there are many things that we in our human form do not understand, but I can promise you this, God is fair in all things, not to worry. God loves his children. Earl from Louisiana. I heard you answer a question about wings and you referred us to Ezekiel, but I didn't catch the chapter and verse. Please explain this again. Well, Earl, you leave me in a little bit of a problem there because I refer to Ezekiel chapter 13, beginning with about verse 18, concerning those that teach my children to fly. God says, I don't like it. Those that teach them to fly to save their souls. I'm against that. That's Ezekiel 13. But then also it talks about the wings or the vehicles in the first chapter as well as others that the craft appeared and Ezekiel saw them and described them as best he could. Everything that Ezekiel knew that flew had wings on it. And so he described them as such in the chapter one. Bobby from South Carolina. I was a Marine in Nam, and I still feel bad about um, having to kill, should I? No, there's this, the generation of Korea and Nam broke the back of communism, did a wonderful job. Now, God's commandment does not stipulate, as it is translated in English, thou shalt not kill. It says you shall do no murder. This nation had many brave people not defended this nation, you would not have the freedom of religion that we have today, being able to bring God's word, being free people that do not need visas to go from California to Arizona or Washington, D.C. If you want to go, you get up and go. That's freedom. And um, it cost a price. Uh, it's not good, and anyone that's been in combat knows, and quite frankly, rarely ever talks about it. It's not good, but it's very necessary, and men know that, don't they? Uh, Simplify. Uh, joy from, uh, and I'm not, I, don't, I do not mean that as in the sense of uh, women who were there know it also. Uh, Joey from Illinois, I would like to ask Dr. Murray if when the fallen angels come back to earth will kind of all, of, will it be kind of all of a sudden they'll be here and um, blend in among us to deceive us or will their appearance be well known among people? Uh, it, it will, as a sign, Satan's kicked out with them. You read of it in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 going to make a big deal out of it, all right? Most people will think it's Christ and his angels returning, and they will be well received. Uh, Jessica from California, my question is, did Christ die spiritually? I heard a well-known pastor say he did. I totally disagree with this statement and feel very strongly against it. Please comment. Well, um, and if, if needed, um, bring out the two before. Well, I, I, darling, you're, you're exactly right. Christ, you know, the reason pastors say, some might, that Christ uh, died spiritually for a moment is because he was quoting Psalms 22, which stipulates, Ela, Ela, Lama Shabbatane, my God, my God, why did that hast thou forsaken me? God didn't forsaken him. He was simply quoting or teaching from Psalms 22. Never. He would have automatically have not been a fit sacrifice 
if he had died spiritually. He had to be perfect, and he was, and you're exactly right. Don't ever, I don't care, I don't care how well known some pastor is, it doesn't mean that he's all that smart, all that, uh, I shouldn't say that, that he's got it together. It's God's Word that is together, not this man or any other man necessarily. You're, you go with your feelings, go with the Spirit, you're right. Marion from Canada, Pastor Murray, my husband and I have studied with you for a while now and are familiar with your teaching on the sixth day creation. Recently we read in Acts chapter 17 verse 26 about all nations coming from one man. Will you please explain this because it's a little confusing to us. Well, number one, check first with your uh, will the Strong's tell you? I'm sure that the Companion Bible will. The word blood does not belong in that verse. That um, And notice the word nations, run it back in that same verse, uh, ethnos or the ethnics. Naturally, through Adam, one man would come Christ. That is to say, through Adam and Eve, through that tribe. And Christ would be the Son of God, and He would bring about salvation. The, um, in the sense, if you would, of the name Abraham, father of many nations. So uh, all people come to God through one man, that man being the second Adam, which is to say Christ. Otherwise, they're not going to be there. I know it offends some if I say that. Nevertheless, that's the way it is. Uh, Betty from Florida, I'm watching your program and I'm learning a lot. Well, that's great. My question to you is, I'm studying with you and I have stopped my ties to the church I used to attend because I'm not being fed there. But should I keep attending church there so I can plant seeds? Please help me with this question. Well, I have to say, as a teacher, you're supposed to tithe where you're fed. On the other part of the question, you have to make your own mind up, and um, God expects us to plant seeds. But always realize, once you do this, you're a guest there, and certainly we behave, as I know you would, as a guest, all right? Um, Irma from Ontario. Where is it written about God's wife in the first earth age? Well, I think uh, what you're probably talking about is a comment um, that I might have made. Uh, if it is written that God divorced Israel, his wife, all right? And you find that in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what is it, chapter 3, verse 8? I think that's it. Uh, um, I know it's verse 8. Is it 3 or not? I would look there, but I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure that's right. I don't think that's what you're talking about. It's why I'm not going to turn there to double check myself. I think you're probably referring to sometime when I was probably quoting from Revelation chapter 19, what would it be along about verse 7 or 8 again, where it says that his wife and then his bride, it's all in a spiritual sense. If he chose someone before the foundations of the earth and justified them, in a sense, they are already married, okay? You will find that mentioned where predestination is mentioned in, in, uh, in Romans chapter 8, and you will find it in Revelation 19 concerning the wife and the bride. William from California, I have a friend who is always asking me for money. I've helped her a lot, but I'm tired of it. As a Christian, I know we should help, but I've reached my limit. How is the best way to tell her I can't do it anymore? Well, it's, it's real easy. Tell her that you can no longer give her money unless she can pay it back, and first she must pay back what she has borrowed, and probably she'll disappear real quick, all right? That kind of, uh, always make agreement with your local banker. You don't loan money, and I'm sorry, yeah, you don't loan money and whatever your profession, you're a bricklayer, well, he and the banker doesn't lay brick. You got that agreement, all right? Sometimes the best way to lose a friend is to loan them money. Kevin from, Kelly from New Mexico. 
Uh, I must say real quickly, many people think Christians are supposed to be soft soaps for everything. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 10 says, if somebody doesn't work to make their own money, they shouldn't even eat, all right? Now we're supposed to take care of somebody that's down on their luck. One time, maybe, or two, and then it's not a thing of luck. They're sham artists. Kelly from New Mexico. I've been unfaithful and I'm afraid I'll go to hell. What should I do? Repent. Tell the Father you're sorry and forget it when he, when he forgives you. He said, I don't want to hear about it anymore. And get your act together. That's what repentance, that's the most beautiful thing about Christianity is repentance. Rebecca from Tennessee. Do our babies suffer from our sins? Spiritually, absolutely not. All right, now, now hear my words. Spiritually, no way, for they are innocent. And I have to answer that in that way because there are uh, sins of the flesh that can even cause deformities in babies. Uh, and um, such as uh, venereal diseases and so forth, you know, or drugs. So I, I say it in that respect. Spiritually, no, no way. Okay, hey, and it looks like I'm out of time. I'm going to take one more anyway. Holly from Tennessee. Mr. Murray, do you believe that the King James is the only Bible we should read? No, you can read. If I were a teacher that, can, that uh, felt I could not trust my students to read anything they want to and be good enough a teacher that it would keep them out of trouble, the things that I teach, that they could read whatever they wanted to, that's the way you do it. Uh, with the Holy Spirit will always protect you. The King James is good because it takes you back to the Greek or the Hebrew by the, using Dr. Strong's work, Strong's Concordance. Again, out of time, brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Most of all, stay in His Word every day, and it's a good day. Know why? Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. Call 1-800-643-4645, 24 hours a day to request the offer. You may also request by writing, Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. We invite you to join us in Serious Bible Student.